Okay, let's start. To... Okay, now I can start, I guess. Okay, hopefully this time everything is working. Go. Yeah. Okay, hopefully it is visible. Is okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And uh, let's start talking about uh, applied biotremology. In particular, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to show you the importance of biotremology as a new discipline that uh, uh, has been studied in the last few years, uh, uh, specifically for application in, for pest control. However, I want to do, uh, I don't know, Vincenzo, if I have the full time or I have to cut a bit shorter. Don't worry, I will stop once it's necessary. Don't worry about it. Okay, no, because um, of this delay. Okay. Uh, I just want to remove this. I don't know if it's possible. Oh. So, uh, the first part of the presentation, I want just to introduce the importance of the agricultural revolutions in the course of the years, because after the first three main revolutions, uh, that is the first one Neolithic, and then the second one with introduction of plowing or first fertilizer, crop rotation, etc. And then uh, more lately, in the from the 50s, uh, the green the green revolution uh, with the mechanization uh, and introduction of chemicals. Uh, however, nowadays we are going to a different kind of uh, agriculture. This is the digital agriculture or smart agriculture. There are many ways to define it. Uh, and in particular, with the introduction uh, in uh, crop production uh, of devices uh, at high technology. Uh, we are in the middle of agriculture 4.0, but however, it's a very uh, quick the passage to the 5.0 agriculture, where it's very important the introduction of robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, and so a system of, of support of the decisions that are uh, becoming uh, more and more important. And of course, uh, technology is a fundamental part uh, in it, and not only technology, because uh, education and training of farmers is a requirement nowadays. There is no more, uh, I would say, the role of a farmer as a pe person that is unaware of what's coming out uh, uh, in terms of technology and innovation and the importance of information sharing. Uh, and on the other hand, we can't uh, forget the role of consumers because uh, the quality that we demand uh, is uh, fundamental for the market. And the other way, the government association and uh, of course also researchers and the community of uh, people like you is crucial uh, to support innovation to transmit innovation uh, to the farmers to the public uh, because the audience is very important when we assist to new uh, changes uh, in, uh, in in agriculture so i, I want explain to you uh, what's going on and what is what happened in the last few years uh, in our land. That, just an example of uh, how important is uh, the innovation uh, in the field of agriculture. Um, my my uh, base is in Trentino, in northern Italy, at the, uh, the southern border of the Alps, and uh, in particular in San Michele Alladige, where it's my center of research. And this area, as you can see from the picture, is an example of integration between agriculture, all these green areas are vineyards, and uh, people, because uh, the villages are inserted into the vineyard, into the uh, crops, basically. And it's very important to find a balance between uh, quality of life uh, and crop production. So uh, this area is totally 100% covered by a pheromone uh, uh, mating disruption method. And this method uh, um, is uh, used to control uh, grapevine moths, in particular, Neopicillium biguella and uh, Lobesia butrana. This species, uh, historically have been treated with uh, 
chemicals, uh, classic methods control. But starting from the late 90s, in particular, 1999, 2000, there was an increasing use of the methyl disruption method that basically in uh, 2003, I would say here, became uh, the rule. So basically 100% of the vineyards in, the, in this area, in Trentino area, were treated with this uh, method of methyl disruption. And uh, many chemicals were banned after this uh, and were not required anymore. And you can see, this is the trend. When we reached 100% of coverage of methyl disruption, the use of insecticide treatments drastically uh, re um, reduced and basically was absent starting from 2000, 2002, when we reached 100% of coverage. But, then one can say, okay, you solve the problem of the use of chemicals in this area. And this is not true. And you know why? Because uh, new actors uh, uh, came. Uh, here, just to show you the problems of uh, the uh, methyl disruption uh, in first instance, and mostly with the use of uh, the so called spaghetti or dispensers for methyl disruption, and then later with also. Uh, emitters of spray, emitters of puffers uh, that were used uh, both in the vineyard but also in the apple orchards in the area. So, what is the problem? Alien invasion. I guess that all of you knows the problem of alien invasion in terms of species uh, of insects, and not only, of course, but in my case, I, I'm an entomologist, I'm the one to talk about the new insects, uh, and in particular. Staphylococcus titanus uh, is the main pest uh, in our area in terms of uh, uh, vineyards and uh, diseases uh, associated to grapevine, uh, in particular Flavicens dore. Flavicens dore is a phytoplasma disease uh, that is uh, widespread in northern Italy and France, uh, and uh, it's a quarantine disease transmitted by, by this insect, the Staphylococcus titanus, uh, which is uh, a vector. So the problem is that uh, treatments uh, are mandatory and uh, plants that are sick must be approved. In this way, our nice scenario of the early 2000s was uh, slowly abandoned and uh, together with the problems associated with the marmorated stink bug, the brown marmorated stink bug, uh, of which uh, my colleague Raquel will talk uh, uh, later, and also Drosophila Suzuki. Drosophila suzuki is a very bad pest in our area, and uh, it requires uh, several treatments, also including uh, some varieties uh, of uh, grapevine. So you understand that the scenario starting from uh, uh, the end of 2000s uh, uh, became more and more complicated. And uh, the use of making disruption uh, with the pheromones was not enough anymore for the simple reason that uh, lifopers don't use pheromones. Marmorate, brown brown with a stink bug use pheromones, but also vibrations. Why? Those of you, Suzuki is a different story. They also use the vibrations, but on different crops. So I'm not talking about Rosophila Suzuki. My colleague will talk about the case of brown with the stink bug. And I'm going to focus a bit more about Scapodeus titanus. In this way, we will talk about the use of bitromology for completing. Uh, the protection of uh, vineyards uh, uh, to support uh, uh, a defense system uh, complementary to those that are already in use, but they were not enough to uh, keep safe uh, vineyards from these pests. So, uh, first, uh, a very quick introduction about the concept of behavioral manipulation. And uh, what is this? Basically, the, the, the concept comes from the use of the, the, the pheromones and other semiochemicals in the, in the chemical ecology. And I already talked about the use and the successful use of methane disruption, but not only because there are many other methods based on semiochemicals, like the use of chiromones, for instance, or for other purposes like monitoring and mass trapping and other things. But there are also semiophysicals. Semiophysicals basically 
as defined here in the left part, are physical stimuli that could be acoustic, uh, acoustically, acoustics, vibrations, and also visual stimuli that can modify the behavior of the receiver as well as chemicals can do. And here there is uh, some example that probably most of you already know, like for instance, the use of sticky traps or traps for mosquitoes or other applications that are based on physicals. Among these, uh, however, there are also uh, vibrations, in particular vibrational signals. And the role of all these semi-physicals can be divided in three categories. That is attraction or repellence, stimulation or inhibition, and interference, and interference uh, uh, in this class uh, is included the mating disruption. So let's see some example uh, of uh, integration uh, of semiochemicals and semiophysicals for behavioral manipulation. And uh, we can see the case of a grammar, the grammar the sneak back, and this is the only picture I will show about this case. And in this case, we see what? Together, the action of chemical aggregation, pheromone, and vibrational, uh, um, vibrational dispense or emitter that together improve significantly the, the, the efficacy of this trap. Another example, however, is a uh, one that we use for Drosophila Suzuki, where you put together, again, chemicals like uh, baits so or food attractant, and the visual is the color. So this is the concept of semi-chemicals and semi-physical in two examples. And nowadays, already, there are many solutions that work together based on these two principles. And then we can find in a vineyard, and in this figure, there is a resume of uh, different uh, uh, methodologies, and uh, all of them are based on behavioral manipulation. You have sticky traps, uh, dispensers for pheromones, uh, for monitoring, for meeting disruption, uh, and we see also uh, mini shakers. Uh, what are mini shakers? Mini shakers uh, are uh, emitter of vibrational signals for vibrational meeting disruption. And then we enter in the field of the biotremology, that is the topic of uh, this uh, presentation. So what is biotremology? Uh, probably few of you know this concept, or they just heard about it, but they don't know exactly what that does mean, but what it means. But let's see. Um, biotremology is defined, was defined in 2016 in a current biology journal for the first time as a separate discipline from bioacoustics. And this discipline studies what? The animal communication by means of the substrate borne mechanical waves that we can call vibrations. And you see that insects, uh, when uh, emit vibrations, they transmit along the surface uh, a message, a signal that can be intercepted by other unintended or intended vibrational receiver. And also there is an eyeball component that is, however, a minority of the message. However, the point is that these vibrations are as effective as chemicals in the communication of many insects. And this is because these are uh, species specific vibrations. Uh, Bathemology, now is a spreading uh, and uh, there are books, uh, there are uh, pages on the web, uh, YouTube channel, uh, World Symposium. So then the, the next one will be, uh, I would like to hide this, I don't know how, but the next one will be in Slovenia in 2022. There are no further problems with the uh, pandemics and uh, <coughs> wars. <coughs> and uh, an important point is that uh, uh, people are more familiar with the sounds. Uh, and however, if you see in this uh, uh, phylogenetic tree, there are a few uh, insect orders or groups that use uh, 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 sounds for communication, in particular, Cortoptera, everybody knows the stoppers, 
some cockroaches, some emitra, everybody knows uh, uh, cicadides, cicadas, but they are a small part of them, and some of the pedoptera. But when we talk about the vibrational communication, the, the pattern is very different, and you see that most of the insects use vibrations uh, for communication. So this is not something uh, like a curiosity, something that involves a few species. No, most of the species, for some reasons, and we will see which reasons, uh, use vibrations uh, for communication. And this is an important, uh, uh, an important point for us because it means that there is a margin for behavioral manipulation and using vibrations. Um, basically, short story, and I want to show you the story of uh, first of the chemical ecology and the making disruption with pheromones, and then make a comparison with the vibration and making disruption, just to let you know the difference uh, in terms of uh, background uh, of, of the two things. So basically, the first uh, recordings of chemicals uh, from insects were done in 1879 by John and Henry Fabre. And uh, however, the first hypothesis of methane disruption uh, was done in 1940. And uh, the first identification of uh, a pheromone, 1959. And finally, the first trials in the field, uh, 1967. So basically, we have the first registration of a pheromone in 1978. It took 100 years from the hypothesis, from the first record of chemicals to the far last uh, point of the development of the first registration for chemicals, semiochemicals, basically, to make uh, uh, making disruption. And from that, this moment onward, you see that there are many registrations of new products for making disruption. But, and uh, when we talk about vibrational signals, uh, and we put again the same uh, timeline, uh, we see that uh, the first hypothesis of vibrational communication is in 1949, so basically 70 years later. And the first demonstration that vibrational communication is something that exists in 1974, when already chemical ecology was. Uh, making their first application in the field. So there is a big gap. And uh, the first test of making disruption with vibration were done in, 12, in 2012 uh, in San Michele, so in our, uh, in our facility. And 2015, as I told before, is the definition of biotechnology as a scientific discipline. So you understand that this is a really new discipline. It's something uh, that, uh, however, deserves to be spread more in the community of the farmers, of the people involved in agriculture, especially for crop protection, and not only. So some example of intraspecific signals, so you understand what's the role of vibrations for the insects. And let's see, mating behavior. So many insects, especially leaf hoppers, but not only, many others, like white flies, uh, psyllids, they use uh, vibrational signals to mediate uh, mating behavior. Without uh, vibrations, they don't mate. Another thing is parental care. And uh, for instance, in wasps, I would like to remove this, I don't know. Uh, in wasps, paper wasps, the females uh, make a sort of dance that is called uh, uh, walking. And uh, by making these vibrations, there is a reaction of the larvae that, like chicks in the nest, they come out and ask for food. And another point is a synchronization of egg. In the case of the brown rotis stink, but when, for instance, the first uh, egg hatch, there is a vibration that is transmitted through, and all the uh, offspring coming out synchronize the exit because. Uh, it's uh, uh, otherwise uh, there would be some cannibalism. So this is a, a, a synchronization for the biological reasons to allow the survivance of all the uh, new hatched nymphs. But there are other 
uh, example for inter specific signals. Those that I presented are just a few of them. There are many other behaviors. So basically, you see that predators, like uh, but predators, but not only spiders and others, can eavesdrop uh, incidental vibrations to find the prey. Or same for species specific uh, parasitoids and predators that can recognize the vibrations emitted by uh, their host. In the case uh, of the eggs, of course, uh, these vibrations emitted by the adults that are abundant in, in, in plant part. Or in the case of some spiders, uh, there is evidence that they can recognize vibrational signals emitted, for instance, by the fopper for mating. So, you see that uh, there is a network of vibrations uh, that uh, is present uh, on our plants, uh, basically any moment uh, during the, the season, uh, of the growing season, of course. In the winter, there is not much of it. And uh, example uh, also of how we can compare semiophysicals and vibrations in this particular case uh, with uh, semiochemicals. And we have, for instance, uh, sort of uh, uh, signals that are uh, harmful for the receivers and benefit uh, for the sender, like in the case of butterfly, Mirbecophila butterfly. What happens? That this butterfly lay their eggs inside the ant nests, and larvae, when they hatch, emit vibrations, and in this way, ants don't, don't fight, don't try to eat them, to kill them. So it's a, a, a defense vibrations that they use to deter the attack from the ants. Of course, these are parasites of the ant nest, and this way, it's a benefit for the sender, but not for the receiver. Another point is also the case of the, uh, the buzz pollination when there is benefit for both sender and receiver when a bee, some type of the bumblebee, they make a, so a specific buzz pollination endowed of a specific frequency that can favor the release by the hunters of the pollen. So in this way, there is a sort of coevolution of the system and it is based on vibrational emission. So you see that there are many behaviors that are mediated by vibrations in different type of insects, in different type of context and with different purposes. And some of them could be uh, used for behavioral manipulation. Just the last example that is uh, more curiosity is ab about a system where elephants that uh, uh, feed from uh, acacia tree in Africa. And acacia tree um, on these can live uh, ants colony and they make the nest, this is the shape of the nest on the, on the twigs of the acacia. So this, um, these elephants, when they eat, create a sort of pattern of vibrations that are at high frequency, that are very different from those caused by the wind or the walking. And these vibrations basically are an alarm signal for the, for the ants, then then go to attack the elephant. They start biting the elephant and the elephant leaves. In this way, it has been demonstrated that acacia trees with ants, with ant nests, are more abundant than uh, without. This means that it is also a protection for the acacias. So basically, there are tons of reasons to consider vibrations as uh, signals and not just uh, uh, random uh, elements in the, in the landscape. And uh, let's see now applications. So this was uh, a uh, an introduction to show you the how, what are vibrations, what is bitremology, what is the story of bitremology, and now we go to see a possible uh, application uh, in, 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 a, in a real uh, and uh, a practical way. So basically, 
uh, I, I will present to you a case study that is uh, the vibration and making disruption of the scaphoidus titanus, the vector of fluorescence today. This is uh, a shaker em emitter of vibrations that is functional to disrupt the mating behavior of uh, this species. So basically, this is a, a, a lithopter and this is a vector of the and has only one uh, host, that is uh, the grapevine. And uh, this is the behavior. The behavior is uh, rather complicated. So what happens? Uh, uh, the start of the behavior diagram is here. You see that males of the species make emits a special song that is called male calling song. A male calling song, uh, males uh, emit these uh, vibrations. The song is made of vibrations, okay? And uh, these vibrational signals uh, travel for, um, I would say, in the order of uh, decimeters, up to one meter, no more, of course. These are small insects, they are three millimeters, four millimeters. And however, normally a branch of, of the grapevine is involved by the signal. If there is a female, she can res respond. Otherwise, the male simply jump elsewhere. And uh, during uh, this uh, cycle of call and fly, it tries to visit uh, uh, as many parts of the plants, uh, of the vineyards, as it can. But when there is uh, a female response, then there is uh, a location duet where males and females start to identify. Sorry, this is ID, identification duet where uh, males and females exchange uh, vibrational signals. This means that they have a duet. Males uh, emit a signal, females respond to the signal, and they make a duet where the temporal pattern is crucial. Because uh, if there is uh, not a recognition, a reciprocal recognition that is based on the distance between the male and the female signal, and I can tell you that this distance must be in the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. So it's a very quick. And if this happens, there is a recognition. Recognition is accomplished and we go to the next step. Otherwise we stop. If there is recognition, identification, then there is location to it. And during this phase, the male send the signals to which the female still respond, still respecting the temporal pattern, but then the male walk and walk, doesn't jump or fly, walk, walk towards the female. And when they are on the same leaf, I need to move this. When they are on the same leaf, there is a car shape duet. And the car shape duet is very, uh, I would say, complicated because in the car shape duet, there are many different elements of different uh, frequency. So basically the main frequency of the first part, uh, the call and fly that we see here, and uh, until the location way is about 100 Hertz, 200 Hertz is very low frequency, but this because uh, low frequency travel better, so, so signals with low frequency travel better for longer distances. But the cash do it, you have a high frequency around a thousand hertz. And this happens only when they are on the same leaf. This means that they use very nice songs, very nice signals for the purpose to court, to convince the female to elicit acceptance from her. So basically this complicated behavior, there are many rules to be respected and as I wrote here, each step is mediated by a phase specific duet, okay, made of vibrations. And uh, the four parts are fundamental, are required to accomplish mating. So the, there is a very important role of the temporal pattern and uh, also the important uh, of uh, adjusting the behavior according to the reciprocal distance and uh, also in base of the possibility to uh, receive acceptance each other to go farther in, in the, in the car ship. And any mistake, this is important, any mistake causes the media stop 
of the meeting process. And in particular, you see this sign here, DN, means disturbance noise. Disturbance noise is emitted by animals, these animals, of course, uh, scaphoideus males, when they feel that something is wrong or when they hear the presence of rival males uh, on the plant. That's an important factor because disturbance noise uh, is specific to make rivalry with other males. And we see why a bit later. So what we did starting from 2006 uh, until 2017 was to develop the vibrational rating disruption system starting from basic research uh, and then we went up, up, up in the technology readiness level. And nowadays, we are working commercial orchards. And basically, we are going to uh, collaboration with industries of the sector to, uh, to, to produce for the market emitters for vibrational disruption of Scapoideus titanus. And uh, this is the disturbance noise. So this one on the right, what happens? This is a signal of the male. And uh, this is the spectrogram of one of these signals. That is, uh, you see, this is a series of pulses. Uh, and this is the call of the male. So the male makes sound like pom, 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 pom. And uh, with a specific temporal pattern and frequency. And the frequency is mostly around 200 hertz. So the disruption noise of disturbance noise of the rival males, uh, basically they cover the same frequency pattern. And in this way, this disturbance noise is masking the signals of the real male. So what we did was simply replacing the real, the real rival male with the automatic systems. So basically what happens in nature, you have the male that is calling, the female uh, establish a duet, and then there is a communication between males and females and mating. But when there is a rival male, this male emits disturbance noise and everything is stopped and the mating is prevented. So what happens? What we did was to replace this guy here with an emitter and the plants are covered by disturbance noise that is species specific because it's covering exactly the signal of Scaphoideus titanus and consider that each species, as we have mentioned before, has different signals at different frequency. So you are not disrupting other species, but you are disrupting those species. Maybe Scaphoideus is not the only one among the millions of species. But of course, for the vineyard, probably is one of the few that is using these. And this is our first vineyard, 2017. And you see that 54 rows of 100 meters. And it's a Cabernet Franc. We use a sound control, of course. It's a still a small area, of course, and we need to make more ex experiments in uh, larger area. So I think that the next step indeed is to pass to a concept area wide like we did with the pheromones before and being sure that everything is working. But our indication seems that is very promising. This is the vineyard and the first one, uh, the first vineyard that uh, we made was uh, the energy was supplied by cables that is just for an experimental vineyard of course. And you see, these are the first shakers that we used attached to the pole and not to the wire. But in a second video that we made in Piedmont, we started using solar panels. And basically, before the pandemics, we had three vineyards and we were in the progress of May to make other two, three vineyards in 2020. But of course, as you know, it was not really possible. This year, probably we start to increase the surfaces in Trentino and in Veneto, that is this region here, to extend the, um, the, 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 the experimentation. This is how it works, basically, if you, with the figure. You see that the plants 
and the scapoideus, and we put our shakers. Everything is shaking through the wires because the pole is connected to many wires. Okay, and the wires. These are different uh, um, prototypes. At the beginning, they were attached to the to the wire, but didn't work much. Then we passed to the poles, and this is the one in the vineyard that are already this 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 prototype is the one that is used in the vineyards at, that nowadays are in function. But this is the new one that will be out from 2022. And you see that the solar panel is together with a shaker that is now um, with a different design and a higher efficiency as in terms of uh, uh, signal transmissions, vibration transmissions. And these are some results in the first vineyard. And you see that uh, we added the second signal also for impoascavitis, that is the Greenleaf Fokker, because it is also treated in, uh, in Trentino. So we added the impoascavitis, we found the frequencies, and we added the, in our instrument that is all for two species. And uh, you see that uh, we had a reduction about 50% of population in, uh, immediately from the second year of uh, application. And um, I want to show you, and then I go to close because we are late. Uh, other ongoing research is just to show you that uh, the, the biotechnology applications are many, and there are still many to be discovered. So here we have uh, an example of the studies that we are doing uh, on white flies in greenhouses. This work uh, has been conducted in the project RELAX uh, together with Vincenzo Mintrastro. And uh, the study on greenhouses, uh, in uh, greenhouses uh, on uh, white flies uh, are also developed in Japan in this period. So it's uh, an important uh, topic for research. And we described again the mating behavior of the white flies, every single step, what are the signals, the importance, and so on. And uh, uh, I have a small video. I don't know if the, the audio is working because we had some problem. Right. We try. I start. Can you hear? No. No. Uh, it's a shame. No, there's always a problem. Anyway, we can uh, we can see it. And you can see that the, the signals that are transmitted all the time during this car shift. And uh, okay, I don't go farther. However, we are also late. However, the mating is accompanied with a lot of vibrational emissions. Okay, let's go. Oh, I made a mistake here. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the system that we developed for the greenhouses. So we have uh, on the benches, uh, we created, this is for the experiment, of course, but we created also big uh, platforms where there is a transmission of a signal that is designed specifically to disturb, to disrupt the mating behavior of the white flies. And uh, these are our experiment uh, still ongoing indeed in, in our facilities with uh, tomato and zucchini plants. Uh, and you see that our results uh, uh, are still uh, are interesting, especially you see that DWS is a disruption of vibrational signals. That is better than water, but is worse than other products uh, that are chemicals, uh, in most cases like veggies. Uh, although we tested also essential oils, a mix of essential oils and plant extract. Uh, and when we put together vibrations and plant extract, uh, we have the best uh, results, especially for the adults that disappeared at the end of the test, uh, while in the other cases, uh, for instance, the dash is after a while, because we made only one treatment, uh, the population uh, rise again, but uh, using vibrations, uh, we have a longer term uh, uh, efficacy. So at the end of the test, uh, the combination of vibrations with extract of plants uh, gave us uh, the best uh, uh, results. Another example is the feeding disruption against the Philanus spumarius. And Philanus spumarius is an uh, infect of Xylella fastidiosa in uh, Southern Italy. And uh, we found uh, through this experiment uh, where we uh, measured uh, the feeding behavior. So through a technique that is called electrophenetography, we could measure the feeding activity. And we found, for instance, 
using this signal that is called the 50, that there was, especially in males, a big, a significant reduction of Sherilem ingestion compared to the control. So basically, it seems that there is not only uh, mating disruption, uh, but it's possible to exploit vibrations also for other purposes. In other studies that we are doing, we see also there are problems uh, uh, with oviposition for some species. So it means this means that we need to go further with the investigation, with the research, in order to better understand in the future what are the potent, what is the potential of using vibration. And vibrations, of course, uh, are uh, have not residuals because when I turn off my instrument, uh, the, everything is stopped and there is nothing that can be affecting uh, other animals like uh, uh, imagine mammals, but also pollinators or people that uh, work there. And other example are about uh, uh, wood border insects like the uh, cerambicid by beetles. These are studies done, done in Japan that are currently done in Japan and in the US uh, and there are also studies that are uh, targeting uh, phyllates. Uh, Bacterigera is a bad vector or the Aforina C3. So US uh, or New Zealand. So we understand that worldwide this is going on. Many groups are working the uh, at this topic because it's a new topic uh, and uh, it's worth it to be better explored. And this is the reason I'm here to try to give you some, uh, some uh, hint about uh, biotremology. And these are the acknowledgements. Uh, and many people uh, have been collaborating with us uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, many projects. Uh, I also thank uh, Vincenzo that is here for the collaboration uh, in some of these projects. Uh, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valerio. I, I was at the time. I tried to be faster to. Now the point okay. is that we are just running a bit late, but no worries. Thank you very much for your uh, speech. I'll ask you yeah. to stop to share the screen. Thanks. And now I will ask Raquel to take the floor. And please remind that if you want, you can have questions on the chat and we will take note of it in the final session. Raquel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, welcome everybody. I will follow on what Valerio already introduced. So um, new technologies and how we can use vibration to control pests. Uh, in fruit production. And in this case, I will talk about Aliomarphalis in particular, which is a species that have been studied since several years now um, by Valerio Mazzoni and his group at the Fondazione Edmund Mack and the University of Trento. I will start with a brief introduction of the species, uh, but even, even if I think everybody knows, unfortunately, the species, more or less, and what are the actual monitoring strategies that are used and what are the issue of these strategies and so why we need to study the communication of these species in a deeper way and how we can integrate semiophysicals and semiochemicals to control it. And I will sum up everything with a very short perspective section. So uh, the brown marmorated stink bug, um, is uh, an invasive species coming from the Eastern Asia. And uh, it invaded Europe, North and South America. Uh, so it, it really spread out worldwide. Uh, in Europe and in Northern America, it's usually active from March to October uh, when we have multiple generation, uh, one or two in the invaded areas, but they can be up to five in the um, original area of the species. And um, adults are the overwintering uh, individuals. The host that can be attacked by these species are uh, extremely high. Uh, they're counted to be more than 100 plant species. Uh, and the damage that is done is done uh, by the feeding. So both adults and nymphs can damage fruits by piercing <clears throat> and injecting their digestive enzyme and sucking fluids inside the fruit. 
and they cause feeding injuries that include deformities, scars, discoloration of the fruit and pitting. And here I will just show you some pictures of the damage that we, we observed uh, that can be done on apple. Uh, and of course, all these fruits are, uh, cannot be sold, sell anymore uh, on pears, but also on cherries. And <clears throat> the picture that I put here uh, from the Cabi uh, webpage is very clear about uh, one of the issue of the species is that it aggregates in very large number. So when this happen, of course, the damage is uh, even higher. And sometimes uh, damages are not visible from the external um, part of the fruit. So this is an example in kiwi. And in kiwi, you have to open <clears throat> often the, the fruit to peel it off in order to see the damage. Also fruits that are usually not attacked by, attacked by feeding um, pest can be uh, damaged by allomorphalis, for example, nuts. Uh, and uh, and this um, was counted with a lot of losses in the market too. And even when the direct damage of the feeding is not an issue, uh, also the alteration of the taste um, can it be, for example, in grape, sometimes uh, sting bugs uh, hide inside the, the cluster. And when the, the grapes are, the berries are processed, the taste of the wine, so even after the fermentation process is altered. Moreover, the um, uh, polyphagous aspect of the species gives it a uh, an opportunity to hide in the environment and to escape pesticide application because they can also survive and feed on a high number of wild and ornamental plants. This is an estimation of year losses uh, just for Italy and uh, just of two years, the 20, 2016 and 2019. But I think it's interesting to notice the difference. So how it, um, it grew the loss just in three years. Another reason why the brown marmorated sting bugs became so unfamous is the fact that uh, it's a very nuisance for the public in general, not just for growers, because it tends to aggregate and overwinter inside human structures, so houses, for example. And uh, the high number uh, of, the, of the species are a big issue for the population. So these are some pictures from the North America, but we have the same issue also in North of Italy. And uh, there were, period in which um, uh, citizens were complaining a lot and couldn't find a solution. But for us or for researchers in general, this was also a um, very good source of information because using citizen science and the Fundazione Edmumac developed uh, an application that could be used by everyone to record the presence of uh, sting bugs on the territory. Um, the help of citizen was very important to record uh, individuals that escape the normal monitoring activities of agriculture and growers. So all the insects that were not in, uh, in crops and were escaping the pesticide application uh, could be recorded with this uh, method. Something that made uh, Alimorphalis uh, such a uh, great pest, great for, for the pest, of course, not for the growers, is the uh, high potential um, ecological niche and the wide niche uh, of this species. So this is a simulation where you can see uh, in the red circle, the regional area in the Eastern Asia, and all the green, dark green areas are the uh, potential and high suitable areas for the species to reproduce. If you compare this situation with this, that is the actual distribution of the species, you see that basically all the area that were suitable have been uh, occupied 
by the species uh, already. And we don't have many information about Africa, but probably just because we don't have the records. Otherwise, everywhere else in the world, uh, the species have been recorded and damages have been found. So this was the picture to say that we need, uh, we absolutely need some methods to monitor the, the species um, in order to better apply pesticide or whatever other um, solution and management strategies. Uh, the monitoring can be done um, using a bit in tray or with visual inspection, but of course these two methods are um, very, um, costly and uh, require a lot of um, human presence and activity. But a solution can be the use of uh, traps, in particular pheromone traps. And uh, at the beginning, it was used a pheromone from another species, from Claudia Stali, uh, that was active also in the mm, late part of the season on Aliumorphalis. But likely in uh, 2014, the aggregation pheromone, the two components of the aggregation pheromone of the species have been described. Uh, and so now the pheromone traps uh, use this uh, species specific pheromone together with some synergistic components. However, we have an issue uh, is the fact that uh, aggregation pheromones do not work exactly like sex pheromones. So when we use sex pheromones, uh, this species that is attracted to the trap is um, able to reach exactly the position of the trap because animals use sex pheromones to locate each other. So to specifically locate the position of an individual emitting the pheromone. In the case of aggregation pheromones instead, uh, usually animals use these kind of pheromones just to aggregate, so to um, find each other in a closed area, but not to stay one next to the other um, or in close proximity. So the landing area is very wide when using aggregation pheromones. And the number of recapture individual uh, that, has, that has been observed using pheromone strap uh, is quite low. Even though um, all genders, so both males and females and nymphs are attracted using aggregation pheromone. So, during the years, uh, starting from 2014, several groups have been working on how to improve the trap with pheromones. Um, this is an example of using a live trap, so a trap that change position depending on the wind, and this, of course, enhances the, um, the, the plume orientation of the pheromone, uh, and so the catching. Another strategy is to add to the trap a uh, uh, kill agent, so usually pesticide. Um, this has been done with the ghost trap uh, or also with what has been called the Nazgul trap. Uh, an issue in this case is that the, the traps are very big and they can intercept also other species and still we are applying pesticide in the environment. The general issue with all the pheromone traps that is linked to the uh, to what I was describing before, the effect of the aggregation pheromone compared to the sexual pheromone, is the spillover effect, and this is probably the the bigger issue. It was it was observed the first time on tomatoes, uh, just shortly after the description of the aggregation pheromone. And uh, it consists in the um, aggregation of all the individual in close proximity of the trap, but not going inside the trap. And this lead to the um, increase in the number of puncture per square centimeters of the fruit that is in close proximity uh, of the trap. So basically using the trap, we were uh, increasing the damage. Why this was happening, I already told you uh, something, but it's better to go back and uh, trying to understand better how sting bugs communicate uh, to understand why this is happening and what we can do. 
So when we uh, take a look, um, a wider look at the communication of stink bugs for all the species, we see that they all use chemical communication, but also mechanical and visual communication. So this is something very common in animals to use a multimodal communication because it enables them to rely on multiple stimuli. Um, but it's often overlooked when finding pest management uh, solution. In this case of stink bugs, the chemical communication is usually used uh, at a very long range. Uh, so usually to find the host plant and to aggregate uh, in the same area. But once the individuals are on the same plant, then they switch to mechanical stimuli, vibrations that Valerio was explaining before. And they use vibratory signals to find each other and to communicate. Um, different information like the identity, the gender, uh, the availability to mate or the territory. Once they are in close contact, uh, at this point, chemical and mechanical stimuli works together. Uh, so they have um, particular hydrocarbons to recognize the gender and to ensure the, to finalize the mating but they also keep using vibratory, vibratory signals for the car ship. So all these elements are working together and they're all essential. And um, probably at the short range when they are on the same plant, so once they get uh, in the proximity of the pheromone trap, what they're missing is the use of vibration to locate the specific source. Um, this is an example of different four different species of stink bugs. Um, the sex pheromones that are usually uh, found only from by males that they use, and the related vibrational signals that instead are produced by female and males. What I would like you to point out is that they have different ways to produce vibrational signals. So each individual can vibrate the abdomen or tremulate or um, beat the substrate in what is called percussion movement. Um, and each of these ways produce a different vibrational signal not only depending on the way it is made, but also depending on the substrate. So in the picture that you see here, uh, you see that for abdominal vibration, for example, there are two uh, signals described. One is, uh, it has been recorded on a loudspeaker and the one uh, on the right has been recorded on the plant. And this has been done also for the tremulation and for the percussion method. Every time the signal that has been recorded is a little bit different. This is essential because it tells us that uh, sting bugs evolved together with the substrate where they are used to communicate in order to recognize the right vibration. So changing the substrate changes also the way they perceive it, uh, they perceive the vibration and the way they produce the vibration. And why it is important to co-evolve together with the substrate and to correctly identify the signal? Because the uh, directionality of sting bugs is based just on the perception of vibrational signals from the female song. So usually females are stationary and the males, um, when they perceive the, the signal of the female, start what has been described as searching behavior that you can see uh, in the drawing. So they start to walk and then they stop and stretch their legs to listen and perceive the, the female song. When they reach a branch, so when they have to take a decision if to go right or left or down on the plant, they usually try to stretch even more the distance between the, their legs because the time delay um, of the perception of the signal with one leg or the other uh, gives them the information about the direction, the location 
of the female that is emitting the vibrational signal. Um, this has been observed and also tested in the um, laboratory condition, especially on Mezzara viridula, which is uh, the model study for vibrational communication. Mm. And you can see here in the graph, whenever there is a stimulation, the chance that the male was making the correct choice and going towards the, the stimuli was higher respect to the uh, random chance of choosing one of the four branches that it could go without the presence of the stimulation. So how can we use all this knowledge to develop a pest management strategies? This picture, um, Valerie already showed it to you, uh, introduced the vibrational trap for stink bugs, where chemicals and vibrations are used together. But when we first thought about these, we had to start from the level zero, even more than one. So looking at the technology readiness levels, because we didn't know anything about the brown marmorated stink bug. As often happens when you're studying invasive species, they're not an issue in their original area. So when they invade a new area and they become an issue, there is everything to be understood and to be studied. So this was the case also for Eumorphalis. We uh, thought, we supposed that they were using chemical communication and vibrational communication, but we didn't know what kind of signals they were using. So the first study um, led by Polinar, uh, was to understand um, what are the vibrational signals used by this, by this species. And we found out that both males and females produce vibrational signals. Mm, uh, here you can see that the recordings were done both on the loudspeaker and on a bean plant for the reason I explained you before that changing the substrate was changing also, uh, often changes the the recorded signal. Mm. And in particular, they found um, one signal and two different signals from one signal from the male and two different signals from the female that were not um, randomly produced, but they were produced in a um, strict um, connection to each other following a path. Uh, that is described by this atogram. So here I highlighted in blue, what is the uh, main path that usually a couple, a male and a female follow uh, to reach mating. Uh, at the beginning, the male and the female were on two different leaves of the plant. And uh, the male was starting emitting the male signal that here is indicated with MS1 to which the female was replying with her own signal. And this started a duet where the male was um, alternating the call, his calls with the female calls. At this point, the searching behavior of the male was triggered by the emission of the FS2 of the female. So the second kind of signal that I showed you before, um, triggered the research behavior of the male that started to um, walk and then stop to perceive the female location until he reached the female. At this point, they started the, the proper carship with different vibrational signals and also the use of uh, probably contact chemical communication. So at this point, we had the uh, description, the entire description of what were the um, key signals that could be used um, to attract the brown, brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, but it, it was to be proved that it was possible to reproduce these signals and attract and fool the male towards uh, an artificial source of the vibration. Uh, in this study, 
um, multiple experiments were conducted using uh, a le uh, plant as a substrate, but also artificial arena made in cardboard and a sort of cage uh, in net that was um, trying to reproduce a trap. Because the, the um, most difficult part was changing the substrate, but obtaining always the same result, the same response from the male. The female on the plant was um, removed and uh, playback uh, with a shaker as the one that Valerio showed you before for the mating disruption uh, was applied to the plant to play back the signal here that you can see. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot let you hear it, uh, but it's a very repetitive signal that it's usually emitted by the female. In this case, of course, we are not a female, so uh, we couldn't emit the signal uh, in alternation with the male, but the playback was looped in continuous on the plant. And um, it was observed that males were more active in presence of the playback and they were reaching the leaf where the, the source, where the playback was positioned. So from where the vibrations was coming uh, more often in a shorter time. So they were also wandering around less when the playback was present. However, we observed that um, probably the absence of the female at the source, or even the fact that we were reproducing artificially the vibration uh, led males to what has been defined as loitering effect, uh, the loitering behavior, where the male was wandering around in circle in close proximity uh, of the playback source, but without uh, stopping. Moving to a completely artificial arena, so, so this um, add uh, an extra level um, of difficulties to the experiment, because this time not only the, the source of the vibration was artificial, but also the material, the substrate on which the male was supposed to find the vibration was completely new to him, uh, and also to us the way it was reacting to the transmission of vibrations. Um, so the arena was made of cardboard and it's circle. The two um, lines that you see that are marked as SP and F FR are um, two um, exit way from the arena, always made on cardboard. One, the SP was um, vibrated with the playback <laughs> and the other one was not. And the color represents the intensity of the vibration. So the dark, the black spot is the one with the higher intensity of the vibrations than the red, and then last the yellow and green are the less vibrated. Even though the uh, gradient of intensity is not very clear, at least uh, for us looking at this picture, the um, ability of the male to find the right exit way, the one with the playback, was very high. Uh, both looking at the number of time the male was choosing it, so going to the um, uh, right uh, exit way, but also the time spent to reach it. And here um, there is a video. <clears throat> okay, it already started, but the male is in the middle part where we released him. It took him a while to start walking usually, so it needed some time to decide what was going on and if he really wanted to move. But once he starts, he already starts doing what I already call the searching behavior. So as you can see, he walks and then he stops for a while, very briefly, and then he walks again. So every time he stops, he is taking a decision, is considering, uh, is evaluating the intensity and taking the decision so to where to go. And after a while, he's already going and wandering close to the exit way that has the vibration.
and here he goes on the exit way. And once he reached the, the right exit way that is straight, he goes very rapidly to the source of the vibration, to the shaker that is out here. In the experiment using what can what was simulating uh, a trap, so um, a net cage with a funnel, a plastic funnel, and then a trap that was vibrated, um, mm -hmm. we saw that the really the importance of the substrate is crucial. So even though after three hours we were able to <laughs> collect most of the males that were released inside the net cage. Uh, as you can see from the color, the vibration was extremely high on the net, so on this leaf of the cage, and on the plastic funnel, but it was much lower on the trap. So uh, a lot of the males were just stopping or going inside the trap and then trying to go out again on the plastic funnel because there the vibration was more intense. It took a while also to um, identify and design the best uh, vibrational signal to attract males. Um, for the issue of finding the right uh, substrate, uh, it was um, evaluated and uh, built this T arena that works similarly to the Y olfactometer for semiochemicals. But in this case, what was supposed to be um, transmitted to the release point that is here in green was the vibration that was applied on the two uh, extremities of the branches. And the intensity was usually applied uh, on one side and not the other in a dual two choice test or in complex choice tests, it was applied on the two parts at the same time and the uh, focal individual was supposed to choose. Here on the right, you see different vibrational signals, all um, maybe identical to an, an expert eye uh, because they are all uh, alteration of the FS2 signal that I showed you before of the female. However, the um, fundamental frequency uh, and the dominant frequency were changed, uh, as well as the distance between one signal and the next. And this uh, enabled us to actually describe what were the most important parameters to attract males. So we found that um, the intensity of the playback was extremely important, especially considering that the higher the intensity is and the faster is the um, locating period for the males, so the, the time that the males take to, to find the playback. The, having a continuous emission of the playback, so looping the playback also helps, as well as using a um, Dominance, uh, dominant frequency that correspond to the fundamental frequency of the signals and a very fast repeat, pulse repetition time. So a short distance between one signal and the next. Um, these that I just described are the results that have been done using a plant as a substrate, whereas the one here with the red uh, rectangle are the uh, experiment that have been done with the T arena. And uh, we found that usually males are not fooled, even if there are two different uh, playback that are played simultaneously, they still prefer um, the one with the best characteristic that I just described from the plant experiment. So here, the, at this point, the proof of concept was, uh, was there we knew that it was possible to attract the males using a playback of the female signal, uh, but the work was not done at all because uh, the main difficulty that we found was to match the emission of the vibrational signal with the substrate and also finding a substrate that was um, clear enough for the uh, male to perceive in the correct way the source of the emission of the vibrational signal. 
And here um, you can see in the picture some of the designs that were developed by the um, agroelectronics group uh, that is uh, producing the, the vibrational trap at the moment. With each design, we were trying to understand um, how was the best way to um, put the, the, um, the trap in the environment. So if from the ground or attaching it to the plant where the, the insects were supposed to be uh, and looking for a vibrational signal uh, and also what were the best material to reproduce what we usually find in nature. So the, the plant and the transmission of vibration in the plant substrate. Last year, we finally arrived to a higher level of the technology readiness uh, level. So we were able and ready to go to the semi-field and field to test the prototype developed from agroelectronics that you see here in the picture that is using a solar panel on the upper phase of the cylinder uh, and a pyramid trap to sustain the, the plastic trap. The vibration is applied inside the um, transparent container and the sting bugs were able to enter from the downside and go uh, and being trapped, looking for the source of the vibration. We tested this prototype in the greenhouse with males, females and nymphs. And we checked the number of individuals that were catched after 20, 40, and 60 minutes from the release. So here, each couple of box plot that you see uh, is the checking done uh, at different time after the release moment. Um, and as you can see, the pink, um, the pink part, uh, which represent the trap with the vibration on, as always a higher number of catches compared to the blue part that it's the same trap, so same design without the vibration. This at least for the females and for the males. For the nymphs, there is a tendency, but not significantly um, dis different. What was uh, curious in this case is that we were expecting these results for the males, but we were not expecting at all the results for the females because from what we know, the female signal is used by the males to trigger their sexual behavior when they're looking for a mating partner. So it didn't make sense that females were also following uh, and be lured to this signal inside the trap. However, these data that we found in the semi-field condition were um, confirmed also by a field test that was done in the Fondazione Edmund last year, last summer, in two time, one um, immediately after the other. So in T1 in the map, you see the location of traps for the first period, and then in T2, the location of trap for the second period. They were a position uh, next to the crops uh, at the border with some um, wood, some non-treated area. Uh, and in this case, uh, we were testing not only trap uh, without the vibration in blue and trap with the vibration on in purple, but also commercial traps with the two um, combination of pheromones that uh, are commercially available. So the RR, which is the rescue uh, trap with the rescue pheromones and the RT that is the rescue trap with the Trissé pheromones. Um, for both adults and nymphs, we saw, um, um, sorry, for both adults, uh, for adults in both period of time, so T1 and T2, we saw that the, the trap with the vibrations on was catching always significantly more individuals compared to all the other kind of traps, but we didn't see this difference for the nymphs. And so these results reflect very well what we found in the semi-field trial. Uh, if we divide 
the number of adults by gender, so in females and males, that you see here in the two graphs below, the um, main difference, um, there was a difference in number of females that were catched that in the field were even higher compared to the males. So in the field, we catch um, more, we caught more females than males. And uh, since the uh, research and the development never ends, uh, this is the last uh, prototype of the vibrational trap that has been called Shindo by Agroelectronics and is going to be uh, advertised soon, probably in the next weeks. Uh, as you can see, it's very similar as the one that I showed you before, but uh, they changed the pyramid trap with a substrate with, that was working even better, at least in semi-field condition in the greenhouse, to catch individuals. So here you see the comparison between the Shindo uh, and the pyramid trap uh, for the captures of males. And the numbers were much higher for, the, for this kind of trap, so without the pyramid. So in conclusion, because I think I use all the time, so we are uh, even more late. Um, I think, well, the, the trap is now reality, I will say. Uh, but there are still other possibility uh, for the use of vibration in pest management uh, of allomorphalis. For example, we know that vibrational signals in other species of sting bugs uh, attract parasitoids and predators. So the role of these signals in the uh, as a synergistic way to mm, manage parasitoid must be studied. But also the um, Vibrational cues and signals are important in other aspects of the life cycle of the species. So, for example, in the synchronization of egg etching, as you can see in the video, usually in the brown marmorated sting bugs, um, when the first uh, nymph etch from the cluster, all the others um, etches almost at the same time. And this is possible just thanks to the vibration made uh, incidentally by the first nymph that uh, etches from the egg. So these phenomenon have been described, but we don't know much about it, as well as the rivalry behavior between females, for example, or males on the plant. So the um, occurrence of other vibrational signals that can be uh, used to implement what we already know. And I would like to uh, conclude thanking all the people that worked on this project because uh, it was very long and it included a lot of uh, students and researchers along the years. Thank you, Raquela, for this uh, very interesting and new presentation. And uh, even if uh, we were uh, late in the beginning of the session, now it's 11.30, more or less. So we have uh, 15 minutes uh, to ask some questions to the speakers, or if you want to start a chat in which we, you can ask something uh, directly, and then we will report in the final session. Uh, I hope that Yuta is uh, here, I think. And uh, if you want, Yuta, you can start with some questions or uh, things about the presentation or the others can even join uh, the group, but please one by one. Okay, I don't see any question in the chat, so I'll be very impolite and start myself this question because I have a lot. Uh, we have a lot of, we, we expect this year a lot of problems with Haliomorpha. And we are fruit growers. So my first question would be also to Valerio and to Rachel. Uh, if you do this, try to uh, do the vibration. I don't talk about the traps now. I talk about the vibrations using for the whole plant. Uh, how, how hard are these vibrations? What will happen to fruit setting if you uh, 
let's say you imply the vibrations at the fruit orchards uh, at the at the file will there happen something or is it so so soft that uh, there will happen nothing i think it's okay. different than uh, grape. no no it's clear the question okay first of all we need to say that uh, we use the different strategy between uh, uh, scaphoideus uh, and aliomorpha because the That's behavior clear. is different. Yes, of so it's not say, oh, I want to apply this to this species. And so we need to study a specific case. But after that, uh, we made measures uh, in the vineyard about the quality of the grapes. Uh, huh? And uh, after four or five years of uh, functioning, we didn't find uh, any difference in the size and the quantity and in the quality of, of the grape. Of course, we didn't do anything uh, about other plants. So this is for the grapevine. <laughs> I can't say anything okay. for other plants as long as you don't make the measure. So my question would be how hard are the vibrations? Do you think there is a risk? And the vibrations are, are micro vibrations. Uh, it's something uh, that uh, the displacement uh, is uh, in the order of micrometers. So it's not something that you go there, you do this. It's like really, mm. if you get close to the shaker, you feel uh, the vibration, but if you go just uh, some distance, uh, only insects can uh, feel it. So we will see or not. Okay, yeah. now I see there are some questions in the chat. Yeah. There's a question from Francois. Did you establish a link between captures in trap and crop damages? Not yet. We are planning to do it, but not yet. Yeah. This year probably we do this. Yeah. And the second question from Flora Araldi, is it possible that the insect generate acute humans to the vibrations? So I think um, if I understood well, they're asking if the um, insect can... Um, in Italy, in, in Italian, should, should sound a sue fazione. Yes, exactly. If they get used to the vibration and so they stop replying to it. Um, well, it, it is uh, possible at the, the same time difficult considering that we are using species specific vibrations, so uh, signals that evolved uh, in the communication uh, system of the species, specifically to uh, have that. Um, that performance to induce that behavior in the in the species in the individual. So it's very difficult that with just a few here of application and uh, just with the application of humans, we are gonna get uh, an habituation to the signal. Much different is if we were gonna use uh, signals that are not. Uh, evolved with the insects. In that case, for example, uh, vibration like noise, general noises, can uh, bring to habituation in the in the past. Okay. Next question is: Do you plan to conduct field trials on trees with vibrations or not to see the impact on stick bug damage? This is part stick of the bug. next explanation. So yeah, no, no, this is part of the next experimentation because we want to see if we can do mass trapping with this ah. and doing mass trapping because at this stage uh, we check that it works, if it is better than whatever is already on the market and we've end to demonstrate that vibrations uh, increase significantly the attractiveness uh, of, the, of the signals. Next step that is starting this year is to see if it's possible to do mass trapping, and this means uh, to reduce damage uh, where we apply uh, the trap. If I may add one thing, Yuta, uh, recently we had another meeting uh, on uh, the vibrations in another project, and there was a request even coming from European Union, in the Commission of European Union, in which the question was about uh, to get in touch with them in order to see if this kind of tools uh, can be even apart of the future uh, plant protection products uh, that we can be allowed to use. Because at the moment, uh, as you may see, we are moving, uh, and this goes probably even to the other question, from an experimental trial to a very um, preliminary trial in open field. Mm -hmm. But we would like to know if this can be in line with the European Commission uh, regulation or not. This is something that is, is in evolution. 
just to be clear. Well, the question would also be if it is needed, needs to be allowed in the organic regulation separately, or if this is just a mechanical issue that does not need any uh, registration. Uh, at this stage, it's not clear because there is not uh, regular regulations about uh, the use of uh, this kind uh, of approaches. Of course, uh, what I would recommend is in any case uh, to to make uh, a study uh, before uh, a proper implementation uh, in especially in new environment because for the grapevine we did a lot of studies we didn't find any problem with the uh, biocontrol agents etc but when you start something new it would be nice to do a study about uh, effects or no target species that's the only thing i can imagine because uh, there are no residuals there are no effects on humans uh, that's clear it's a thing, and not on the plants as much as we know. The question would be the side effects on, on other, other insects. Exactly, that's the point. Uh, it should be better investigated whenever you uh, extend uh, these uh, to other plants. Of course, for the traps uh, is a uh, different because the traps are, don't need to be installed uh, on the plants, but they are just mo mobile. So it's another thing, it's like a trap, so. Yes. Okay, there is just a question about the side effects, and then there is a question of Francois. There was a question of Marlene before, oh, and, yes. uh, in which uh, she was uh, referring to the speech of uh, Rachele, and she asked about the TRL level of this. Uh, we know we, we used to call shakers or tremors, Marlene, just uh, according to the commercial name you want to, you want to use. Anyway, uh, Rachele. Yeah, we actually mentioned the TRL uh, both for the um, mating disruption with Valerio that with the vibrational trap. For the vibrational trap, uh, this year they are producing in, um, commercial numbers, the traps. So Shindo is the commercial name of the trap by Agroelectronics, TBT. Mm -hmm. um, whereas for the shakers, um, it's not, yet, uh, it's not yet available on the market, uh, and we are still testing it in commercial orders, but it's under test. Yeah, I would say that TRL8 uh, for the um, for the vineyard, uh, while uh, the other one is ready for the market, TRL9, uh, that uh, needs... Uh, uh, this year, they will be produced some thousands of uh, traps, uh, and... Uh, According to what happens this year, probably next year, the scale will be much uh, larger. Mm -hmm. So this year is just a few, a, a, a small production uh, to start uh, the, the, the distribution on a few uh, farmers. Yes. Okay, there's a question from Francois. Is it possible that females are indirectly attracted in traps by males catched through other communication modes? So this uh, is actually possible for the field experiment, mm -hmm. but in the semi-field experiment, so in the greenhouse, we were releasing just females and then males in a different trial. So the, the females that we catch were catched alone with no interference from other uh, stages like names or males. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to imagine that for some reason, uh, the, this signals has also an aggregation uh, role. And this is uh, the reason we, something we need to study better is, for instance, uh, is a test uh, in the lab uh, with the T arena that uh, Rachel showed you with the females. We never did that with the females. We only did it with the males because they were our target. Mm -hmm. And now we go into the lab again and see what is the reason of this because it, we are surprised too. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, there are no other questions, so I have another question by myself. We have an orchard where there is um, an, an invasion from Haliomorpha from one side. Would it make sense to put these mass traps there and hope they would catch the Hallium, uh, most of the bugs before they invade the whole orchard? Or would they attract even more? No, I think it will make sense uh, at least on the border. So from the, the side where the invasion is coming from, trying to um, stop them before they invade the orchard. 
So in that case, I think it will absolutely make sense. Also because these straps are standing alone, so they can be positioned um, not in close proximity of the plant, but a little bit farther, so that even the spillover effect wouldn't um, make a damage <clears throat> to the fruits. And what would be the cost of one trap? I suppose this works with solar, uh, with solar energy, so you don't need um, any. Do you have an idea? Mm, I have a personal uh, <laughs> experience on this, as uh, Raquel and Valerio knows, uh, because we set up, uh, excluding the tremors, uh, all the other things. So the, the wires, uh, the solar panel, uh, the, oh, yeah. the you, are, you are talking, however, of the systems that we are in the vineyard now. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah the, the traps are... Ones. The traps are standing alone, so each trap yeah. has its own uh, solar panel and yeah. there is no connection to be made when yeah. you are buying it, it, it works by itself, you just have to put it uh, in the sun. And, and the new tremors uh, as well, because uh, uh, I showed the, the, the new version with the solar panel by itself, so they are also standing alone. And uh, yeah, for the traps, uh, as much as I know, is... Uh, Two, three hundred euro. I don't know. Yeah, a few hundreds euro. Yeah. Per trap. Yeah. Including the solar panel. Yeah. All, all included. Do you have to come in contact uh, yeah. how, how we could buy this? Because I think there is one farmer that is very nervous and there is the Haliomorpha invading and we are just standing there and observe and tell him, yes, it's very nice. She's coming here and we don't have anything that we can do. And uh, well, what do you think what a distance should we have between the two the different traps? Uh, well, these are all questions that we actually yeah. still don't know because yeah. we are planning to, to test them this year because yeah. we, we finally got the final trap now. Uh -huh. So it's going to be tested in the coming season. Yeah, with the 2021 trap, that is the pyramid, we did test at 20 and 30 meters. And 20 meters yes. works much it's better than 30. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not because of the higher number, but as a ability. A trap, if they're put at 20, they catch more than put at 30. But of course, this is done on the 2021 model that is not the Shindo, because the Shindo will be carefully evaluated in 2022. Yes. Thank you. There was another question from Miriam Berud about the side effects on crops or other insects of the vibrations. We are evaluating them too. So, for example, the secondary effects on um, other insects is what Valerio mentioned before. So, non target species, we have some preliminary data. Uh, on parasitoids and predators like spiders, for example, of big poppers. And we didn't see much of a difference, but we are still evaluating it. And it must be done probably also in a more uh, detailed way uh, in laboratory and field condition. Uh, for the plants, um, there is not much known about the interaction between mechanical stimuli and plants. There are controversial uh, results, like some studies say that they're actually beneficial to the plants, some studies say they, they are not. Uh, so we, are, we just started to study also this aspect in relation between plants and vibrations, specifically with the vibrations that we are using and the intensity that we use for pest management. Yeah, and also we don't know exactly the, the, what happens to the pathologies, because yeah. uh, we are now starting to test the uh, effects on, on uh, downy mildew and powdery mildew. And we are seeing something interesting, but it's too early to say something. Yeah. There is another question. Do you think yeah. we could trap Haliomorpha when merge before winter places, when it emerges before the wind, from the winter places before they arrive in the orchards? This is a big question. <laughs> a good question. This is something uh, interesting. Okay. What, what we know for sure is that the, the vivo trap works very well at the beginning of the season. Mm -hmm. Because when they get out of the shelters, uh, they, they want to uh, mate immediately. So they are very, very... Uh, what we found is that in May and June, we had very good results. And then this tendency 
go down because uh, in September, October, they don't care much about uh, mating and they just want to go back to the shelters. So the, the difference uh, between uh, vibro vibrations on and off, uh, it's especially in the first part of the season. So yeah. the question is right. And probably this is what we want to see this year. If we can impact population in the beginning when this population is smaller. Okay. Other question, could you share the names of the traps again? How are the names spelled? Yes, I'm writing them in the chat. Thanks. That would be great. Kindle. It's a Japanese, uh, means uh, like vibrations. Uh, in, Quick uh, vibration, or the vibration from the earthquake. In Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can anticipate something, Valerio, about the, um, field the more than field trials, uh, the greenhouse trials that we did uh, even in another project uh, as a source of uh, as an alternatives to the use of paraffinic oils. And uh, we can affirm that in another research project, Utah, we came to see that the use of alternatives to the paraffinic oils uh, and the use mostly of vibration at uh, at least at greenhouse level could have a positive effects in the reduction, probably phasing out uh, from the authorized PPP, such as paraffinic oils uh, in the organic regulation. But this is still something that we should present. And it's the, still ongoing also. Yeah. We have still a test uh, trials uh, ongoing, so. Yeah. But they seem to be promised. We have good, good. We need further trials, but I think that probably this coupling of different methods could be useful for yeah. reduction of the use, at least of paraffinic oil. Yeah, one important thing is that uh, we need to consider vibration in the complex uh, of the crop protection strategy because in the in the, um, for instance, in the greenhouse experiments that I showed in my presentation, uh, they were particularly effective when combined with the extract of plants. And um, so this means that uh, we can't consider a solution, but part of the solution. Yeah. Um, sorry, I received a, a message from the other breakout room. We have to close because uh, we have to move on the final session. So. I close this room and we will recommit with the other colleagues uh, in the common session. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Mm. Okay.